it's taken. Okay, we're live now. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Hangouts and Air for the Society for One Place Studies. And on this occasion, we are introducing our shared endeavour for 2017, which is faith in your place. And as some of you will, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> as some of you will know, we've been doing these shared endeavours every year since we started the society, and we decided that this year would be a good time to have a look at faith in all its guises. So, just to give you a brief idea of where we're starting from with this. What will it be about? Well, it will be about places of worship, of course, in the widest possible sense. So not necessarily just churches and chapels, but if you've got mosques or synagogues or any other uh, denominations, place of worship, then those can be included as well. It'll be about the religious leaders of those congregations and events associated with the places of worship, be it um, celebrations when a new uh, bell tower is put on the church or the parish tea or anything like that different events associated with all your places of worship and then we'll look at the records that those places of worship have created over the decades and also some context some background to religious history of whatever country your place happens to be in in order to see how what's going on in your place fits into the wider picture. How does this work? Well, it's going to work in a very similar way to, to most of our shared endeavours. The one we did last year was a little bit more free and easy. This will be similar to the ones in the previous two years. Uh, first of all, we'd like people to declare an interest and to say that they will be participating in all or some of the project. Otherwise, it gets a little bit disheartening for those of us who are trying to push this forward when we think we're doing it and nobody's actually taking part. So there is already a, a place on our forum, on our website, where members can say, yes, I'm, I'm going to join in. But we know from experience that there are often more people taking part than that forum might indicate. So do let us know that you're going to come along for the ride, because otherwise we really don't know how effective we're being. The task sheets are already on the website. Uh, under Shared Endeavour project, Projects, Faith 2017, they're already, the first task sheet is already there. And I hope you will participate in, in not necessarily all of the activities. You may not feel that you have time for them all. You may not feel that they're appropriate to your place, but you're, you can pick and choose the ones that suit your particular study. There will be, the plan is that there will be four task sheets in all with a series of activities for you to take part in. And each one will last roughly three months. So the one that's up there now, if you're going to take, carry along in real time, starting or starting from now, I guess, uh, that should take you up towards the end of March. And we do hope that you will feed back because one of the main reasons to do this is so that we can share what we find, we can share our successes and our failures, our ideas, our methods and our sources and compare our places with other places elsewhere because it's that comparison that sets our own places into some sort of context. Otherwise you have no idea whether what's going on in your place is typical or atypical. So that's really important part of this. And the other great advantage of taking part in the shared endeavour is of course that it spurs you on to actually get on with something. We all have these wonderful intentions that this is the year I will do this for my one place study. And then for one reason or another, it gets put to the bottom of the to-do pile. But by actively saying you will take part in something and in being encouraged by the others who are taking part, it really does motivate you to actually moving forward and, and getting on with the next job in hand. So the tasks list then, um, there are, we've divided the project up into nine categories uh, designed to take approximately six weeks each. Some of them will be something that you will do and then that will be it. Others will be ongoing and you will be continually adding to your findings for those. Issued, as I said, uh, roughly, roughly every three months and the first one is there already. I will try and get the second one there before the end of March for those who are keen and chomping at the bit and wanting to get ahead. 
They're available in the members area of our website as PDFs. If anyone has problems accessing them, just get in contact uh, either with me or with our webmaster uh, and hopefully we can guide you through how to access these. So number one's there, ready to take you through to the end of March, as I've already said. And do follow along with as many of the suggestions as possible. And deliberately, some of them require you to feed back. So I hope you're going to not miss all those out. The idea is that we compile a shared list of resources, a list of useful books, of articles, of websites, of record sets, and this will be updated throughout the project. There is a, a very preliminary list up there at the moment. Now, because I put that list together and I'm in the UK, it is very, very UK centric. And we really, really want input from those of you who either have a, a study that's overseas or maybe you have a study in the UK, but you live overseas and therefore you have knowledge that would help about the country that you live in. Because we're a worldwide society, we want it to be a worldwide project, but inevitably no one person has that worldwide knowledge or even a comprehensive knowledge of what's going on in one country. So the idea is that you send me ideas and suggestions for other resources and then when I've got enough to make it worth altering I will take down the initial resources list and put on an updated one. In fact one's come through about five minutes before we started this hangout so I will be adding that on ready for uh, version two of the resources list and you'll find that resources list along with the task sheet in the members area of the website. We are using the forum for this particular project. I know some members tend not to go to the forum. It doesn't always suit everybody, but I would encourage you to have a look, even if you don't want to make a comment yourself, to see what other people have written. It's in the members area of the website. You need to go to members only and then forum and then scroll down and you'll see an annual projects faith 2017. And there are several threads there already. And you can subscribe to the topics, which basically means when somebody else posts, you will be notified. If you'd rather not do that, don't forget to check back to see what other people have contributed since you last looked. So far, there's a roll call of participants up there. So you can join that thread and say, yes, I'm hoping to take part in some or all of this. There is a thread for suggesting sources and resources and one for listing your progress and your problems that you are having and also your findings. Now, your findings is slightly different from your progress. Uh, to me, your progress is saying, I've got to the end of task one, aren't I wonderful? And we'll all say, hooray, well done. Um, whereas your findings are a little bit more rigorous than that. It's more about exactly what you are discovering about a certain aspects of faith in your place. So that might be a little bit more detailed, whereas the progress one is more of a tick list. Yes, I've got this far. Um, how are other people doing? I really couldn't do task three, little point, little one. What's, what's going on? I've got a problem with this. So that's what that thread's for. If we find the need to add additional threads as the project progresses, then we will do that. Um, at the moment, I can't think of any we might need, but I'm sure other people will. And uh, if you let me know, and I feel that there's a, a real need for something different because what you want to talk about doesn't fit under any of those, just let me know and I'll add that on for you. We will be having uh, more Hangouts associated with the project. The next one, which is going to be led by Janet Barry, who was in the room before I started screen sharing, so I hope she's still is. Um, she's going, to, oh good. <laughs> well, maybe at the end you might want to say a few words about this, but the 13th of January uh, is Janet's turn and she's particularly looking at, at non-conformity. And the idea is that there will be hangouts devoted to the shared endeavor in May and August and December next year and we have got a possible guest leader for the may hangout but that is yet to be confirmed so i'm not going to announce that yet in case it all doesn't happen blog posts we would like to put more blog posts 
on our website that relate to the project. Uh, you might have found a wonderful source and be able to write just a, a couple of paragraphs about that. Blog posts tend to be sort of 300, 600 words. They're not three volume novels. Just something that we can share. Send them to me and I will upload them. And uh, ideally, if you've got a copyright free illustration that can go with it, so much the better. All right. If you haven't, I might try and find one or we'll just put it up as text only. You might have come up with some wonderful method of researching faith in your place. And again, that can be a blog post, just a short little piece about what you're doing with the research or the data that you're encountering. And then, of course, what are you finding? Uh, perhaps you'll find some scandal involving one of the ministers of your place. I do have a lovely one, but I'm, I'm saving that. So you'll have to keep checking back to find out what that was. Or maybe something about the context. What's going on with the religious history of your region or country? And perhaps how does that relate to your place? And any of those can provide a blog post. And you can send them to me at any point. There are some tasks which say, can you compose a blog post about this as you work the way through? But don't wait for those. If you've got something you want to say, I don't mind if we have a blog post every day. So you don't think, oh, I've already sent two. Dare I send another one? Please do. That would be great. And then Susie would love longer articles for destinations. And really, similar topics apply to the, the blog post. They're always welcome. It's a great way to share your sources, methods, your results, and your conclusions in perhaps something that's a little bit more extended. We don't mind if it goes in destinations and you want to use it on your website as well. That's absolutely fine, but do share it along. Uh, we already have articles on the Shared Endeavour scheduled for March and June. In fact, one of those I've already received, but we want more. It doesn't matter if we have two or three articles in each destinations issue throughout the, the year. Because Destinations is an online journal, um, it can be as long as we like. There isn't a page limit, although I think Susie might balk if we had 50 articles for each, for each issue. But I, I, sadly, I don't think we're going to come to that. But don't hesitate to send something in. And we, if, you, if you're worried about how it looks or how it sounds, we can work on it with you if you think it needs refining a little bit. If you'd like to volunteer or just send it in, please do that. The Jenny, idea, just, yes, certainly. I'll just pause you a minute. Mm. Um, we've got Ros has just joined us in the room. Hello, she Ros. Can't actually, she can't actually see your presentation. I wonder, if, is it possible for you to turn the presentation off a minute and just come back in the room? I can do that. Yes, if that makes a difference. I will try that. I have to do magic things. Let's try that. I'll try unscreen sharing and screen sharing again. Stop. Hello, is everybody. Is that, is that now I, I've got to go back and start screen sharing again now. Does that make any difference, Ros? Ros has got her mic muted. Sorry, I should have gone to the um, slide that I was on. Well, that's the best I can do, I'm afraid. Um, the only thing you can do, Ros, is to watch the, the video afterwards to catch up with the, the slides. And if anyone else is having the same problem, that would, would be a no, possible I think solution. Ros has still got issues. OK. Well, I'll, I'll carry on, and hopefully we can resolve those some other way uh, a little bit later on. Okay. Uh, we will be having a conference again next year. I think those of us who attended the one this year would agree with me that it was a, a lovely, friendly atmosphere uh, and we all got something out of that, that day. And as we've always done since the society formed, we will make the theme of the conference the theme of the shared endeavour. So next year's conference, which is on the 28th of October 2017, it's probably going to be in Manchester. That's highly likely. That's what we're aiming for, because we're aiming to visit the John Rylands Library. Now, I've already been in contact with them. Unfortunately, they don't do group visits. However, they will allow a group to visit. 
uh, which sounds a bit contradictory, but basically we can go in a group, but they don't do a tour or anything like that, but their staff are on hand to advise us. I have been before. They have got some fascinating stuff there, so it is worth a trip. So that's the plan that we will visit John Ryland's library on the Friday afternoon, but obviously that's still to be confirmed. We do want speakers. Um, <laughs> And unlike most conferences, we don't say if you want to present, it's an hour or nothing. Um, we do use our members as our speakers, mainly because we've discovered that our members have an awful lot of expertise and really there's no need to go beyond that. Uh, of course, the other advantage is that we make our members talk for the nice warm fuzzy feeling you know love and joy rather than hard cash which means we can keep the price of the conference down but that's really not the main reason why we do it we do it because our members know exactly how to angle a presentation to the needs of people doing a one place study because they're doing one themselves and we do allow presentations of any length up to an hour so if you just wanted to contribute something very short that's fine and we'll fit that into the program to fill the day and that the last two years has worked I think very well so please do offer I mean offer now offer nearer the time when you think you found something but consider doing that we're, we're very friendly and non-threatening um, so it, it is it's a good opportunity and I think people who've presented in the past have found that actually it's had benefits for their one place study because someone has come along in the audience and said oh by the way I've got this I know this have you tried that and so uh, it's a bit of a two-way process and also in the conference you can have a display board or a display of your own one place study um, and it, if it features faith in our place then so much the better Yes, you don't have to say anything. So if you really, really, really don't like standing up talking in front of some really, really friendly people, um, just bring a poster or a display board or a booklet or something and show us what you've done. The whole point of this is it's shared. It's not about me because I'm leading it this year. It's not about me doing all the work. Uh, it's not about everything being handed to you on a plate. It is about a two way process. So obviously we want you to take part. That's the important thing. It would be lovely if you could write a blog post or an article for destinations to show us how you're getting on. Attend the Hangouts in here. Watch the Hangouts on air afterwards if it's an inconvenient time for you. Perhaps consider making a presentation either verbally or in a display form for the conference. Okay. And please do send in suggestions for the resources list, otherwise it's going to be a very short list. So I've done the best I can. Uh, I've now exhausted my ideas, unless I discover something new during the project. So please add to them. It, there is a lot more out there that I haven't touched upon. Make some comments on the forum so we know how you're getting on. Ask questions, seek help, exchange ideas. And we will be using our Facebook page and our Twitter feed and uh, exchanging information in that way as well. So you don't have to do all these things, uh, but maybe do one or two of them. Now, collaboration. This is something that we have really has only come to light in the last 10 days or so. Uh, it, by coincidence, um, the Family and Community History Research Society that some of you may know of, some of you may belong to, um, are also doing a topic that relates to religion. For the benefit of those who aren't aware of this organisation, I'll just um, tell you a little bit about it. The Open University, which for the benefit of our overseas listeners, is a way in which you can study for a degree in a modular form from your own home, used to run a course whose code number was DA301. Uh, family and community history. In fact, I, I tutored the course. Um, when it came to an end, a number of the former tutors and students decided they didn't want to let the whole thing just lie dormant and they, ref they formed this association which encourages its members to research 
communities and families in a fairly academic way. And they do do mini projects and, and more extended projects which encourages people, members, to feed in what they are finding in their own areas to gain a broader picture. And they have chosen this project, Communities of Descent, from 1850 onwards. And that's going to run, I believe, for two years. And we are able to uh, piggyback, really, onto their project, if we so wish to. Now, obviously, ours is a much broader project and it's got a slightly different focus. We're not focusing necessarily on a time frame, although individual members might choose to focus on a time frame. But there may well be opportunities for us to contribute to what the Family and Community History Research Society are doing and vice versa. So this is all very new and we're in the very early stages of working out how this collaboration is going to work. You are only allowed to take part in their project if you are a member or if uh, you are being represented by someone who is a member. So I will be a member and because I'm a member other people who are members of the Society for One Place Studies will be able to contribute. Now clearly the Family and Community History Research Society would love it if you became a member in your own right but for the purposes of this project you are you are able to contribute through me uh, they don't accept institutional membership so actually it's my my personal membership that you're you're piggybacking from uh, it's too soon yet to be able to distribute the full details of what's going on there is a little bit about it on their website if you want to go and look um, but as soon as we've worked out exactly how this is going to function I'll be putting out more more details in case anyone wants to look at this. And certainly I think it will tie in very well with what Janet is going to be talking about in January. Uh, so maybe have a look at it. And by that time, we'll have exchanged emails a little more uh, and we'll be able to tell you a bit more about what, how this is going to work. So it is over to you. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and rejoin you. Hold on. And give you a chance. Oh, there we go. Lovely. Give you a chance to say what you think, whether you are going to be able to join in and maybe what's special about your place in this respect. Um, perhaps I'll start with Janet and then Janet you can maybe tell us a little bit about where you're going to go with the hangout next month as well if you want to. Thank you very much Janet, yes, uh, good introduction, thank you. I'm interested particularly in the history of nonconformity in my place and also in my personal ancestry. My personal ancestors were all God-fearing Baptists who didn't even baptise the children and therefore didn't leave any records anywhere. Um, <coughs> yeah. But uh, my place, or the, the area of East Lancashire in which my place is situated, has quite a long history of nonconformity. We have a Friends burial ground dating back to 1670. We have a Baptist church dating back to 1672, although they would love to believe they were older, and that's an issue we'll be discussing. <laughs> um, we have a wide range of Methodism, um, Israelites, the Baptists, the, uh, almost a full full house of nonconformity. We have the Plymouth Brethren, the exclusive brethren, or we used to. We also have the Jehovah's Witness and the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, and had a community from our area who went over to Utah in the early days of Mormonism. So the area was involved in Mormonism at a relatively early stage. As for mm -hmm. the, yes, yeah, so there's lots. It's also a lot of recusants in the, the Civil War as well. There's a large hidden Catholic um, population with priest halls all over the place. As regards the hangout on air, I'm certainly not going to do a history of uh, nonconformity, partly because it's in most of the books and partly because there's so many branches and diversions and reunifications that it, yeah, um, pardon me. It easily gets too complex. I know Janet F is an expert on Methodist uh, history and it's uh, a tangled web. <clears throat> but we will look at some of the areas in which 
non-conformity has affected your place or my place and in which my place might have affected non-conformity and some of the things that happened in my place because there was a big non-conforming community. Um, have a look at some of the myths that might surround them. Is there any basis in fact to them? Have a look at some of the things that are going on nationally and to what extent does what happens in my place, your place tally in or differ with those um, and have a look at what people want to believe but might not necessarily be true because there's uh, quite a few areas in which what people wanted to believe and what people wrote and what people decided is what had happened there's not actually any evidence that it occurred not high power stuff I'm not an academic um, but those are going to be some of the areas that we're going to be touching on well, lovely thank you very much um, <coughs> Hello, Peter. Welcome to the welcome Hello. to the panel. Sorry, um, I'm late. That's all right. We'll uh, we'll remember. <laughs> um, are you hoping to take part in some or all of the? No, I don't think I will be able to. I'm interested, but um, I've got other things going on at the moment, so I shan't be. But uh, I'll be following you. You can be an interested bystander. Yeah. <laughs> oh, in fact, there's a member of our history group here who's very interested in the Baptists in the village and uh, I might try and get her involved a little bit. Oh, yes. Ah, that, would be a, that would be a good idea. Uh, I don't know that Bros can, can contribute. She has... Her mic's uh, muted. Her mic's muted. Um, Susie... Oh, sorry. Oh, the his, uh, uh, No, nothing's happening. Well, um, I'll have a go, but I oh. think it's... Um, can, oh. you hear, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's good. Can you, can you see us, Ros? I can see you perfectly fine. Okay. Yeah, I, I had switched, I had muted my microphone because it just seemed good manners so you didn't hear my heavy breathing while <laughs> Janet was speaking. <laughs> um, let's see, faith in my place. Well, I haven't investigated it very far. Um, this is going to be the year. Um, from what I can see, there doesn't seem to be much non-conformity because it's not a very big place. So there was only room for sort of a church and that's it. Um, but I have seen that a surprising number of people came from parishes round about, which had their own churches, but they came to my place to get married and to baptise their children. Um... And I'm, I'm interested to find out why. Why didn't they get married and baptise children in, in the place where they lived? Why did they feel it so necessary to come, you know, miles out of their way to get married in a church somewhere completely off the beaten track? <laughs> Perhaps one of them was underage. Well, hmm... It's interesting. I've got, Sorry. Go on. I've got some in my, I've got um, a Church of England church and I've got what's currently called the Independent Chapel. Um, but there's also a history of primitive Methodists and um, various other groups who may or may not have been in that church. Or rather, I'm not sure whether they used that particular church as their place of worship. Um, but I've noticed that a lot of my um, independents got married in the Church of England church um, and I'm given to understand that that was because marriage otherwise would not have been recognised and their children yeah. would have been deemed to be um, illegitimate. Yeah. Yeah, so if, right. they want, if they were people of property and they wanted to leave things to their children, then they had to get married in the Church of England church. Yeah. That's um, right. Now, I don't know whether you can see, anybody can see this? Um, Debenhams. Ecclesiastical oh, History, yes. which was a book that was written by our local history society um, some years ago. And there's some really interesting stuff in there. So I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to contribute anything over and above that, but um, there is a, a rumour that there was a third Church of England church, or sorry, a third church, which was a Church of England church, um, but nobody knows the site of it. So I would be interested to find out more about 
physical location. Hmm. I almost wish that I was uh, studying Ottery St Mary because that's hmm. where an awful lot of my ancestors came from. And they were all people like Protestant dissenters and independents mm. and oh, talk about nonconformism. <laughs> you have um, my problem. Uh, but uh, it, it would seem that it, uh, the burial ground, at least for them, is under a car park, which is really <laughs> helpful. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so there was a lot of um, nonconformism there. And of course, my my lot have to be in there because we're rebels, of course. It's interesting that Ross said that your place is too small to have much of a nonconformist population. There's certainly places near here that are small, but still manage to have a Wesleyan Methodist and a Primitive Methodist chapel within a half a mile of each mm. other. Yeah. I don't. I think half a mile is too far, actually, for for my place. It's <coughs> it's one of those places that's sort of one street, one pub, one church, one oh, school, right. that sort of thing. <laughs> so I doubt very much that there could be a, there could be two churches. Just the village I was room. brought up in. <laughs> I, we went to the Wesleyan Methodists, and we weren't allowed to talk to the primitives. <laughs> And that's not that long ago. Yes. <laughs> you might get contaminated, Peter. I know. <laughs> and the Baptists, well. <laughs> I am quite interested because my, um, although not for my place, but my personal line has got um, three or four different <laughs> lines of Huguenots coming into them. But I... I I haven't found any history of Huguenots in my place. Yeah. <coughs> um, I think we've lost Janet. I think we have. Um, has anybody got places that has many non-Christian places of worship? No. No? No, I haven't. We've Ooh. had... We had... Um, migration into East Lancashire after the Second World War from the Indian subcontinent. So we now have started to see the development of mosques and Islamic centres. Mm. That would be an area that would be interested to look at. Yes, I, I bet that would be really interesting. But I haven't got... Uh, although, having said that, um, there is a family who actually work in my place who are um, I think they come from Bangladesh originally and they're Muslims and um, they run an Indian takeaway there but they don't actually live in my place um, but every year we have a, a what they like to call a, a Bollywood do and so we have Indian culture and Indian drumming and dancing um, but there's not not much in the way of faith going on in my place in terms of um, mosques and stuff. Or anybody got any Jewish congregations? We haven't. No. 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 I, I said, uh, how big is your place study, Janet? Well, Sprinkle itself is just 12 houses, so I'm obviously not limiting it to that. <laughs> there is a Baptist I did wonder when you, when you were saying. <laughs> there is a Baptist church just on the periphery, which I am looking at. But um, the town itself, of which we are part, is um, probably about 30 or 40,000. So, yes, there's a fair bit to go at. Mm. Obviously, I'm not transcribing the census for all of that. <laughs> Well, I guess altogether I've got I've got my Debenham study, which is two, one church, one chapel, and an unknown site. And then I've got four other surrounding villages, each of which has got a Church of England church. So not all, not very big, but all the independents and the, all the um, the nonconformists were all from the surrounding area. All came to Debenham. And how far were those journeys? Were some of them journeying for some distance to come and worship? No, not really. Five miles. That's a fair step on foot. Yes. We've got, yeah. we've got some interesting things that I would like to find out about. I, I, don't, I won't have time this year, but um, 
the Baptists, I found our Baptists actually worshipping at Rome's, which is 30 or 40 miles away. We're talking about 200 years ago, and they were, at one point, they went through some sort of ceremony of being expelled from there so that they could come and form a community here. And obviously they they went there um, every Sunday. They, they, there was a, a group of them that were very regular. So I don't know about the travel arrangements. Yeah. Perhaps they had a carriage. Yes. Well, I don't know, but they see it. I was amazed when I found it. Wow, that's amazing. Well, we've also got possibly done it by foot, could they? Yeah. Well, the other the other little bit we've got is that there is a another church building marked on some of the old maps, and in the Edwardian uh, inventories, with church wardens, and plate and you know robes and everything. We don't know exactly where that was. That's in our Needingworth in the other village from where the main parish church is. <laughs> little bits I'd be like to find out about sometime. Mm -hmm. How big's your place, Rose? Minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, there, there are five ducks. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, there's five nonconformist ducks. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> so it sounds as though my place is probably the largest then. Quite possibly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at the moment, is about 2,000 buildings just in Devon. That's so without the surrounding villages. Mm. Because Janet's place, sorry, the other Janet's place is, is quite small as well, isn't it? Mm. She has a big uh, Methodist tradition in her place as well, doesn't she? Yes. I think yes. it's uh, be interesting to get some of the uh, ramifications of that and how that played out. Yes. Um, as the study well, goes on. With all your <coughs> your different nonconformists, Janet, did, mm -hmm. did they all have different places of worship? Yes. Yes, they did. The place is littered with um, old chapels mm. that are now houses, warehouses, tattoo parlours, flats, <laughs> goodness knows what. Oh yeah, dog grooming centres, everything. Um, they did, sometimes within 20, 30 yards of each other. There'd be uh, small areas with multiple churches. Um, yes, they did. And I'm currently looking at the um, 1851 religious census. And trying to work out exactly what was there at that time and there's many that I, and I thought I knew most of them but there's many in the area that I had no idea existed at all um, ranging from this, those claiming regular attendances of five six seven hundred to those who were just 20 or 30 in somebody's back bedroom mm. Mm. I, I don't know if anybody else has looked at that uh, 1851 religious census for their area yes I've got um, mine because I've got the one for Suffolk and I've looked at, at mine for that. I can't remember what it says off the top of my head. Yeah. Well, is there a specific one, uh, a religious census then? In, mm. it, in 1851, there was mm. a, a religious census was taken where the leader of each place of worship was asked to report on where they were, what denomination they were, um, how long they'd been there, how many places they had sitting and standing as Sunday school scholars and and then how many attended on this particular Sunday um, and any comments that they wished to make. The questions were slightly different for nonconformists and for Anglican churches. So how do you how do you get hold of this then? It's, Where do you find it? It's on the National Archives website. So mm -hmm. if you um it's, it's <laughs> It certainly is there. I can't remember off the top of my head what the record set is, but I can look it up for January. Um, but it, it's certainly on the National Archives website and you can search for it by, by place. Mm. Alternatives, if you, if you put religious census 1851 and then Lancashire in my case, that might take a link to the relevant place in discovery. Or if you know the poor law area, because some of them, I, I think in, in the National Archives, they're filed by poor law area rather than by parish. Right. And that might help you find it through Google that way. Yeah. There's probably one in your local record office. Yeah. <coughs> hmm. I think I found mine on 
eBay. All right, I've only seen an online copy. I haven't got a hard copy. Was it actually printed and published? Uh, yes, it's a hard copy somewhere. Okay. And was that done by a local record society? Yes, it was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll be whether your local society has, has got round to doing it or not. Mm. Or whether they've concentrated on something else. But it's, it's well worth a look at. It, it's very interesting. There's some of the comments that people make. I am not answering this question. It is not your business and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> the snippets that people fill in from official done. That's quite good. Uh -huh. so. Sounds like what, what women used to write on the, um, on the census, doesn't it? No vote, no <laughs> census. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And all the stories you hear of the 1911 census and people putting in their cats and occupation mouser and things like that. Oh, yes, yes, I've seen lots of those. <laughs> quite funny. Well, there's nothing quite of that standard that I've seen from my place. But I've is... got a... Sorry. Go no, you go. I've got a, um, an interesting little uh, newspaper snippet. Um, I'd love to know more about, but it gives a little picture of Methodists in our village. Uh -huh. Can I read it to you? Oh, go on. <coughs> Can you hear me now, yeah? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. In 1839, the Friends of the Wesleyan Sunday School held their anniversary at the pub, one of the pubs. The children, about 115 in number, having walked in procession through the village, received their last year's subscriptions, together with a plum cake of a pound weight and a glass of wine each. <laughs> that I, this is Methodist, yes. Oh. <laughs> when the children had been dismissed, the teachers and friends sat down to an excellent tea, which had been provided under the superintendence of Miss Thorpe, who, being the most active person in the institution, deservedly met with the highest encomiums for, from the speakers in the course of the meeting. <laughs> it just struck me that in the phrasing and what, what might have gone on. I don't know what was happening, but... <laughs> It wasn't like that at Sunday school when I was a Methodist. <laughs> I think it's interesting that the Methodists met in the pub. Um, well, yes, yes. I, I was brought up in the Methodist church, yeah. and they would have social drives because they weren't prepared to advertise them as whist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> and you yeah, my, father, my father was strict <laughs> teetotal as part of the Methodists. Yeah. And you Made up for so later. But. <laughs> You would have social evenings with supper because they weren't prepared to advertise dancing. Yeah. That's the other one. So, yeah, it's interesting that. Welcome back, Janet. Sorry about that. I don't know what went wrong there. It suddenly, everything told me it was all over and I, I had to, you know, we, we cannot reconnect you and all sorts. Oh. So I, um, I hope you've been chatting amongst yourselves without yes. me. I'm sure you have. Yeah. Yes. I thought I'd just show you my copy of the census of religious worship. I don't really even see that. Oh yes. So um, so it's uh, it's quite thick for Suffolk. I'm not altogether sure who actually did it. Oh, Suffolk Record Society. Oh. So yes. There's certainly one in print for Hampshire. Hmm. Yes, I'm not sure a Lancashire one has been transcribed, but I've managed to find scans of them on the National Archives website, so they're there uh, for those who have access through that. Hmm. Um, Devon was done, but is now out of print, um, but you can get it in reference libraries and so on. Because yeah. um, yeah. that's the one I would need for... Yes. Yes, no, no, the one that I need is the one that's out of print. No. Yes, <laughs> but you, you should, you, at least it's been done though, um, which yes. is one up on some counties. Um, yeah. They should have copies in the record offices. Well, yes, according to the National Archives, it says that a microfilm copy of the religious census returns 1851 is in the Plymouth and West Devon record office. Oh, right. Not available at the National Archives. Oh. oh. Mine certainly is, so that's a shame. 
Mm. It's a shame because that sounded like an interest, interesting mm. avenue of, uh, of for research. Because I've managed to download the PDF and therefore can work through it at leisure mm. and don't even have to be online. So. Right, eBay, here I come. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you Google for it, you sometimes find um, there's archive, I think it's called archive.org. Yeah. They seem to have done a lot of um, um, yeah. scans. So sometimes the translation isn't quite what it could be, but um, even so, you might find a freebie one online somewhere. Oh. As we speak. Yes, me too. <laughs> on, uh, <laughs> I think on, we all Google at the same time. <laughs> on, on Amazon, but twenty pounds. It looks like we don't want to pay that. For <laughs> Ridiculous. Yeah. Well, oh. the, the thing is that you probably only want <laughs> half a page. Mm, probably. Um, yeah. You probably don't want. You know, you you just want the little bit for for your parish. Um, yeah. Apparently, it's on Histpop as well. Yeah. Oh, is that nationwide on his pop? Um, I think so. Right. right. Oh, a, yeah. Google, a Google digitization project, and apparently you can get the full document from uh, yeah. archive.org. That, that's mm. what I'm looking at as well. But I haven't tried either of those, but apparently it's on his pop. Yeah. There's certainly a. Um, a mention of it on there, but whether it's actual images, I don't know. Yeah, the, the report the report is indexed and can be viewed page by page, with each page downloadable in high resolution TIFF or lower resolution PNG format. Ah, that's, that's excellent. On, on Histpop. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Or there's the Google Digitization Project, which is a the whole thing is available as a single PDF file. Ooh, this all sounds good. <laughs> oh, I see it. Uh, Census 1851 Religious Worship. Mm. Table of Contents, at any rate. Um, That's more time going down the drain then. <laughs> it's yep. good that this is going to be my last week of work before I break up for. Um, Christmas, so I shall have lots of days of research. Oh, yes, oh, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy. <laughs> enjoy. <laughs> oh, it, it says here that OHPR is an AHDS history project, and I, I read that as um, um, as ADHD history project. <laughs> <laughs> it may be both, <laughs> it may well be. <laughs> oh, dear. Yes, uh, University of Essex. Ooh, uh, gosh, mm, all well, sorts if, of fun things. <laughs> if anyone gets as as far as the actual link, which allows you to get to the um, thing on his pop, please do share it. I'm I was still yes. groveling around in the indexes somewhere. Post it well, on a forum, and then we can all. Yes, yeah. Yeah, actually, I was going to find find this. This is where ah. that goes there, but then once you get there, I mean, it's just as confusing. <laughs> it just seems to be their homepage, really. Mm. Oh, well, we'll, we'll have, a, have an investigate. <laughs> yes. Oh, Keep us out of mischief. Uh -uh. It would certainly be hugely useful if it was one mm. more widely available. Yeah. That's a, a really good starting point, and then you know that's sort of 150 years ago, and then you can work backwards and forwards from that point yeah. as to yeah. to what was and wasn't there before and afterwards. It gives you that snapshot, doesn't it? Although looking at them from my place, I found that some of them are a bit light on detail. And, yes, uh, yes. I think I put one on Twitter. It said, "Not name of church, none." Parish was blank, township was blank, council was blank, I'm sure that gets it down to about. And uh, so somewhere there's a primitive, uh, there's a particular Baptist church in Lancashire. Okay, fine. Uh, yeah, really helpful. Right. Uh -huh. Track that one down a bit. Mm -hmm. 
what makes me laugh is that they all because they have to give how many people attended the service on on the census day and there's always like these excuses well normally we have a lot more than this but <laughs> just today we, we didn't or else they all they all end in zeros you know so there's exactly 200 and you're thinking no there wasn't you're, you're guessing <laughs> and, I, and, I, and i bet you're overestimating <laughs> there was probably 197 and a dog yes <laughs> Or more likely 97 a dog and it's a bit optimistic you know yes yeah and i think there was a bit of my church is bigger than your church as well oh yeah. you know it's yes, definitely I think there's a bit of a spiritual one-upmanship there <laughs> i found that from time to time oh yes i see hmm. Rods has just posted a link yes yes there's, a, there's the archive.org link Mm. which um which looks quite promising actually because the the different download options you have include things like kindle and pdf oh right yes i like this this looks good <laughs> i wonder if that but that, uh, it's worrying me that there's only 167 pages because that looks to me like the sort of statistical overview rather than the parish mm. by parish returns well, there's 40 for uh, Haslingdon Poor Law Union for a start. And yeah, that's just one exactly. Poor Law Union in East yeah. Lancashire. So. Yes, I'm just. But even so, it would be good for background, won't it? And, mm. and oh. context. Um, I think that will. Just, uh, yeah. Make a note of that one. Oh. Well, I thought I'd posted a link on the forum, but it seems to have died, so we'll try again afterwards. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to do too many things at once. The wonders of technology. <laughs> I get that to work. Yeah. I was also wondering about um, mapping and the techniques for where they were in relation to each other, how many of each denomination were in which particular mm. geographical area, were there clusters or were they reasonably evenly spread out mm. throughout larger places? And Very happy the, to help there. Yeah, waiting for your email. And one of the things we were chatting about whilst you were off air, Janet, is uh, yes. what redundant chapels are used for now. Ah, oh, yes. And yes. Uh, the range of uses to which they've been put sub subsequent to deconsecration. Like barns and things, yes. Oh, yes, the two shops we've had. Yeah. I mean, that's all part of the history of, of faith that the move towards secularization i suppose we have to call it in in more recent times and the fact that instead of virtually the whole community attending some form of religious worship on a sunday that is now considerably diminished yes i mean they, it used to be that you got fined for not turning up to church yes yes, yes. <laughs> you know so it was a quite and and the fines were horrendous so it was so much e easier to just turn up and go to sleep probably yes. um rather than risk you know it, it's in, it's almost an entire year's wages at some point oh that's yeah, horrendous she... didn't i don't know about that sorry? But certainly in, sorry i don't know about that but certainly in the local baptist church to my place you had to pay to sing in the choir <laughs> wow. Can't imagine that these days. No, they'd be only only too pleased to have you in the choir. Well, they wouldn't be too pleased to have me in the choir because I can't sing. <laughs> but, <laughs> but but back to what you were saying about distribution, because my parish has three Bible Christian chapels. It also has a Wesleyan Methodist chapel, um, and an Anglican church and a Baptist church. And it's not a particular. I mean, it's a population of about eight or nine hundred at the time. But it's interesting to know what the catchment areas of these, mm. for example, the Baptist chapel, there aren't many Baptist chapels in the surrounding parishes. So if you particularly wanted to go to a Baptist chapel, I suspect that that was pulling in from surrounding parishes, whereas the Wesleyan Methodists and the Bible Christian chapels weren't because the surrounding parishes had those as well. And I think we need to be a little bit aware of this so we can see we might have the only whatever it happens to be for that denomination for, for some considerable distance in which case you're getting 
outsiders coming to your place in order to worship and of course vice versa because if you've got somebody of a denomination in your place and there isn't that particular place of worship then they're going to go elsewhere and where are they going to go how far would they have to travel if they needed i don't know a synagogue or a catholic church or whatever happens to be appropriate and also the arrangements to which these congregations went to in order to facilitate that and we have a quaker congregation meeting house sorry um in one of the moorland villages it's still a moorland village and it must have been in the 18th century when this was recorded and they would have their monthly meetings their business meetings on the evening of full moon so that people could see to walk over the moors to get to it and just hope that it wasn't raining that night or it wasn't too cloudy but they, they would generally adjust the timings of their meetings to facilitate getting there and oh, even maybe. when i was even when i was growing up um churches in one part of town would meet at 10 30 and churches in another part of town would meet at 10 45 because that's when the bus got in yeah <laughs> yes uh, wonderful yeah <laughs> Yes, actually, I'm thinking of, of my own um, desire to, to get to a congregation that I needed to. When I was li living in Glastonbury, I used to have to go up on the Saturday to Bath and stay overnight with a friend and then go to church. Mm. <laughs> because there were no buses. There were absolutely no buses. So that's how I had to do it and that's possibly how some of um, of the people in our places had to do it as well they had to go somewhere stay overnight with a friend or a family member and then they could go to church wow yes and of course there's a whole raft of itinerant preachers as well isn't there which are going to be very difficult to pin down because they're preaching in the open air and unless there's some kind of newspaper report or preacher's diary we're not going to know that this particular person came and spoke on the village green and on such and such a time and that that, that was available to the people in our place uh, i know some people got fined for preaching on my village green uh, so so i know they were there then but there must have been all sorts of other times when there was open air preaching when it didn't attract the attention of the media and we just don't know about that and i think yeah. it's obviously a gap that is going to be impossible to fill of course if it did attract the attention of the media i'm sure something like that would have been reported in the newspaper the yeah. local newspaper yeah. there's, there's also the uh what you might call the denominational societies that, you know with their libraries and their researches because mm -hmm. that's um and certainly people there's quite a bit about the people from Needingworth as I said who went to the church in Rons, um 30-40 miles away the book about that so they've got a lot of detail in mm. including who fell out with who and who traveled to where and <laughs> who was responsible for that and they they were banned some you know all sorts of stuff wonderful yeah but uh, yeah it's not particularly about my area but it it's um, it's covering that and it gives you the context and the the idea of the links that people would go to at that time oh yeah to, there was uh, one of the preachers was um I, not to the house of lords but he was taken to some sort of court in london uh, for preaching the wrong thing oh, wow, wow. <laughs> that that reminds me of something else actually one of the houses i looked at the deeds in our village it's lovely because it's got um about 100 years ago they bought a, a, a three foot width of ground that used to belong to the church the baptist chapel and um therefore all the deeds relating to the baptist chapel and therefore the manse were all included in the bundle and the the deeds for the manse had wonderful theology about uh, two a three sheets of what the person who was going to live there had to believe in oh my goodness <laughs> wow. how, how wonderful and i you know and, because my background i could understand a lot of it once i'd managed to read it but um what people thought of it you know later on i don't know <laughs> oh, it sounds like there's going to be some potential for some of us to to take this a little bit further mm. um would anyone like to 
make some concluding remarks before we come to the end of our our brook. Well, can I can I put in my penny worth about mapping? That I'm very Please happy, do. very happy to help with any mapping things relating to this, but I won't be able to put much effort in on the on the actual, you know, the, the religious um, faith side, but because I'm concentrating on the mapping, but yes, very happy to help with that, you know, in what, whatever way I can. Lovely, thank you, Peter. That would be brilliant. Thank you. Right, well, I think we'll say thank you very much for attending. I apologise for my uh, involuntary absence halfway through there, but at least I had got to the end of the bit that I was supposed to be presenting. And I do hope that those in the room and those listening, either in real time or at a later date, will consider taking part in some of our project, because I think we're going to have quite a lot of fun with this one. So mm -hmm. please do join in and share. And we'll see you all next month for Janet to talk about nonconformity on the 13th of January. Oh. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.